an interest I had had perhaps since the uh, days that medical anthropologists discovered female genital mutilation and got completely incensed about it. And I was a, had been an anthropology student myself, and I remember thinking the first time I heard about this is, why are we all so upset about this when we do this to little boys? So I obviously had enough awareness and enough consciousness about male circumcision at the time. This would have probably been in the early to mid-1970s. Uh, when I look back now, I realize I had a, um, a brother who had a botched circumcision. He was born when I was 11, and it was um, not spoken of, really, but he had to be taken back to have uh, something to have a, uh, another procedure and I remember my mother coming home with him from the pediatrician and uh, everybody you know, being a complete basket case and it wasn't until many years later, really until I was part of the movement that I realized that it had probably been um, male stenosis and had to have his urethra reopened. So I, I think it was in my consciousness for a very very long time the way I became formally involved, though, was when I was 47 years old and running a nonprofit health plan in New York State. I decided to go to law school, and when I um, and I just was going to take whatever I wanted because I never thought I'd be a practicing attorney. I just wanted to go to school and learn some new things, and I really think of law as anthropology and. Um, so I took and I had a degree in public health. I was working in the healthcare field, so I took. Um, I took bioethics and health law, and I also took a lot of international uh, courses, refugee law, immigration law, and human rights law. And I just kept coming, I kept thinking about circumcision, about male circumcision, and particularly about childhood circumcision, infants and boys. And it just became the most, it became my focus, really, uh, my last year in law school. And I wrote a paper about it for a bioethics class and I, like a lot of us I think, who, who didn't really realize what, what a movement there is, what a movement there has been, uh, I was, first I was taken aback, my god, there's, there's a movement of people who are actually working on this, you know, I, I sort of, not like I thought I discovered the issue, I wasn't that arrogant, but I certainly had no idea how many people were involved and for how long. So through that I remember the first time I received an email from uh, George Denniston and the first time I spoke to Marilyn over the phone and started reading what people had written and looking at websites and I just became involved and um, that, that's really the beginning of my activism. One day in probably early 2008 or late 2007, Marilyn asked me to be on a phone call where a number of intactivists, sort of a core group of intactivists, were talking to a man named Dean Pisani, who is a Texas businessman who had been donating to NOSERC for a number of years and had told Marilyn he wanted to do something larger but needed more of an infrastructure and a plan. So she brought me into the phone call, and over the course of a few months, I I stepped forward to pull together a uh, consulting project. I hired some social enterprise consultants I had used in my healthcare work, and we developed a plan for a new organization and met Dean, the potential donor, a number of times, and a number of us gathered in Texas, where his office was, and then finally in New York. And at the end of this planning process, he asked me if I would take it on and offer to put a million dollars up. And that was the beginning of Intact America, the formal beginning. Of course, the beginning of Intact America was the, was the movement, which predated any involvement I had. So you can't say no when someone offers a gift like that. And I'm, I was able to really very luckily um, kind of draw from some of the resources from another nonprofit that I run called the Hudson Center for Health Equity and Quality. So we were able to start up in a way that we didn't have to go out and rent space and buy phones and buy computers. We were able to defray the expenses of the host organization. I had a very progressive board of directors who saw this cause as 
absolutely part of our mission, which was to, our, the mission of the Hudson Center is to advocate for a cost-effective, high-quality, humane healthcare system. So everybody felt, as I did, that in activism, that, that um, not circumcising baby boys was humane, cost-effective, and high-quality thing to do. So we were able to start it that way. We, it took some work to get the press to be interested. We've done this a couple of times now. So the first time was the CDC. We told the, we told the media, Washington Post, the New York Times, look, this big national organization is going to recommend circumcision. They've never done this before. That, that got the attention of the media. Then we ran an open letter uh, to the, um, uh, we, well, when we were in Atlanta for the CDC meeting, we had a movable billboard that said, tell the CDC not to recommend circumcision. We had a picture of a baby and that billboard was on a truck and it went all around Atlanta. The Associated Press was interested in that. Then we did an open letter to the American Academy of Pediatrics. I'm gonna fast forward though, because something much more interesting happened this spring, just as we were wondering, okay, what's gonna be our next opportunity to really get out there and make some noise. And we thought it would probably be if the CDC or if the AP actually came out with recommendations. And just out of the blue, completely out of the blue, none of us would have anticipated it. The AAP, for some crazy reason, put out that new policy on female genital cutting and actually recommended that federal law be amended to allow doctors to perform a little tiny ritual nick on baby girls' genitalia, aimed, of course, at the African population. Uh, they even referred to taking girls back to their native countries. Of course, these girls' native countries are America. It's America. These girls are born American citizens, right? We were so astonished. And because we were set up, we were very astonished, so we spent a week being astonished, or five days, and then we mounted a campaign. Within three or four days, we had generated 15,000 emails to the AAP, incensed emails. Uh, how on earth could they be thinking of, instead of, of thinking about, about recommending against the cutting of boys, because that's gender equity, that they were actually expanding pediatricians' purview and allowing them to, uh, to perform this gentle cutting on little girls. Well, you know what happened. Everybody who's, who's seeing this knows what happened, which is that they had to retract their statement. But it was a wonderful opportunity for Intact America to get out there. We, we've always said from the beginning, we protect all children. We want to protect all children. I don't think any of us would have believed that an American medical group would actually come out in favor of any type of female genital cutting. Now maybe we were naive, but it was a wonderful opportunity for us to promote the gender equity argument. I believe that the way the intactivist movement is, is spreading uh, is through really common sense. People, as we have the opportunity to get, get our message out there to tens of thousands of people and say, now wait a minute, let's think about this. Is it really okay? Is it really okay to cut little boys if we can't cut little girls? Is it really okay to cut half the population? What could be wrong with the body as it's evolved over millions and millions of years. And, and as I remind people who, who I know through my work, people don't do what doctors say anyway. So people don't stop smoking when their doctors tell them to stop smoking. They don't not eat mayonnaise or they don't not uh, eat fatty foods. They don't exercise. So the fact that a bunch of doctors who make money off of circumcision might recommend for it, it it, yes, it's depressing. It's really too bad. And some people will say, oh, yeah, well, I guess, you know, really, this really does prove that it's a good thing. But, but no, I think we have, uh, I think we're going to win. I think the rate's going to continue to go down. I don't think the circumcision will probably be outlawed anytime soon. But I believe that our message, as, as we're conveying it now, after all these years of intactivism, is going to sink in and common sense will prevail.